years ago, I participated in a, in a funeral at a Catholic church. And the, the person who died was a former organist of my church, which was, was a Presbyterian church. And another pastor participated. He went on to serve in a Methodist church, and she was also able to participate in the service. And the priest was a cousin of the deceased, and he invited us to be part of the Eucharist or the, or the communion service. The only time I have ever participated in communion in a Catholic church, I got to part, I got to help serve. I, I said to him, are you gonna get in trouble? And he said, not with the people who were here. If there were other people here, I couldn't do it, but with the folks here, I'm safe. And I, it, I treasure that memory, it gives me hope. Uh, my most vivid memory, however, is after I, I drank from the chalice, I looked down and I was wearing lipstick. And I'm like, oh, this is a first. <laughs> as, I, as I took the, the cloth and wiped off the cup. We have all, I imagine we all have Catholic family and friends. And I imagine that you've been to a service where you've been invited forward uh, and you cross your arms and are given a blessing. Why aren't we able to participate? You probably know, but we're going to go over different understandings of, of what happens to the elements during communion because that because our lectionary passage from today, John 6, opens that door. So we're gonna we're just gonna walk through it. In the Roman Catholic Church, the teaching is that when the priest prays over the bread and the cup, it becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And the you know theological name for this is transubstantiation. Trans, like to transform, to change, to become something different, and substantiation meaning substance. So the substance, it is transformed. It is no longer bread and wine. It is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Catholic Church is highly influenced by John 6, what I just read, and they take it very literally. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. The crowd who heard that must have been completely confused by what he was saying, uh, but the 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 folks to whom John was writing, the early church, they were already participating in this meal. And then I think we've gone back to being confused, or at least we have disagreements about what happens and how we're supposed to understand it. In a Catholic mass, uh, Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving, we could call it Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion, is it, the whole service leads up to that. That is the most important part of the Catholic service for uh, the Reformed tradition of which we are a part, it's all about this. It's a proclamation of the word. It's a proclamation of scripture and its interpretation. Uh, but for Catholics, it is, it is Jesus becoming part of you. And I like that terminology rather than thinking that we need to literally eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ. Because if you think about it too long, ill. But Jesus becoming part of us Yes. And now if I were raised Catholic, um, I would be fully indoctrinated and, and understand it, and it better, I am sure. But I was raised Presbyterian. But not all Protestants believe the same thing. Uh, and I'm going to differ, uh, present different understandings. And I don't know you all well enough to know how many different traditions are present in the room because some of us were raised in different traditions and then found ourselves in, in the Presbyterian church. In my former church, the music director was Lutheran. The youth director was raised, no, she was raised Catholic, but she became Episcopalian. Uh, the church that I served was Methodist and Presbyterian. So we had lots of different uh, understandings. Uh, in, and, I, and so I'm gonna say to you, hopefully I will nuance everything well. If I don't, please tell me afterwards because I, I like to learn, but I did do research. Uh, so forgive me if I don't do your tradition justice. 
My understanding of the Orthodox tradition is that they believe in transubstantiation that becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ. They're not too fussy about supporting it with, with scripture. It's just the tradition and, and it's accepted. That's very Orthodox. Now, you also need to remember our ancestors believed this too until Martin Luther raised an eyebrow and started this little thing called the Protestant Reformation. Luther vigorously denied transubstantiation and he's been accused of believing in in consubstantiation uh which is which is our tradition now con means with there's lots of spanish speakers in within this congregation i know so con con contigo conmigo with right so the spirit of god is with the elements it's with the bread and with the cup um it doesn't become doesn't transform but the spirit of god is with this is what John Wesley of the Methodist Church believed. This is what John Calvin of the Presbyterian Church believed. The Episcopal Church, which is the closest to, to the Catholic Church in the Protestant denominations, they are deliberately vague, right? which I, it's so interesting when you research all this stuff. You can believe either, and there's room at the table for you. Uh, the uh, Catholic worship services, you have eucharist every service the same is true for the episcopalians but believe it or not that's also our heritage in calvin and geneva they they celebrated communion with every worship service we could we could go back to that if we wanted to and we'd be true to our tradition uh, and finally one more is wingley Zwingli was a theologian from switzerland and he didn't believe in in anything magical, mystical going on. He said, we do this because Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Of me. We just remember Jesus at the table and that's it. That's, that's our Baptist brothers and sisters, a lot of our evangelical brothers and sisters in faith. That's what they believe. It's just a table of remembrance. So which way of thinking is right? And what's at stake? I, I firmly believe that, that when we die and go to heaven, there will not be a theology exam. Um, <laughs> and, and if there is, I pray that it's an essay exam. But anyway, but, I, but it's our, our relationship, our eternal relationship with God is based on grace. I might have eaten that word, so I'm going to say it again. Our eternal relationship with God is based on grace. Love no matter what, love despite um, and this table, in my understanding, is about grace. Jesus saying, for you, O oh, clu oh, clueless people, I would lay down my life. I would give my all so that you might know that nothing can separate us from the love of God. It is meant to, to convey the sacrificial love of God for all of us. And it's a whole other sermon to describe all that the that that our understanding, reform understanding of what the of what the table of what celebrating the Lord's Supper is meant to convey, and and the mystery of what we don't understand. But that that's a different sermon today, just focusing on on our understanding of what happens to the elements. But as you know, this table ha has become divisive. Um, I have sat hurt and angry in worship when the love of God is proclaimed up front and then I'm not invited to the table uh, because I don't believe what the folks up front believe or and what I believe they can't know. But that being said, I, I've been influenced by, by Flannery O'Connor. Someone once told the Catholic writer Flannery O'Connor that, that it would be more open-minded to think that the blessed sacrament of the altar is a great, wonderful, powerful symbol. And her response was, if it's only a symbol, to hell with it. I want to honor the deep faith that believes that, that uh, to participate in this meal is to, to bring Jesus Christ into your very being. I, I honor that. And I don't believe it's a symbol. Our tradition doesn't believe it's a symbol. Um, I have experienced the Holy Spirit more presiding at communion probably than any other place. Um, and, and talking about the Holy Spirit can make Presbyterians very, very uncomfortable. But I want to honor 
that belief that that believes that Jesus is truly present at the table. I believe that too. But I also think that Jesus weeps that the table um, has, has been used as a weapon uh, or that people are denied participation. Last week I shared a story of, of doing a sermon on, on stewardship of creation and, and how it became a political sermon. Um, even t- talking about participation in communion, what's in the news? that Catholic bishops are trying to deny uh, participation from President Biden because he's pro-choice. Theologically, I think they're standing on very, very dangerous ground because if they're determining participation in the meal based on everyone's compliance with Catholic teachings, again, who can stand on either side of the table? The Presbyterian Church used to limit who could participate in in this meal. You had to be baptized in order to participate in the Lord's Supper. Now we don't turn anyone away. Believing the the, the scripture story that is very influential in this in this change of thought is the road to Emmaus. The disciples are working walking with Jesus. He is you know opening scripture to them. They're completely clueless. Their eyes are opened during the meal. People's eyes can be opened to the reality of Jesus Christ at the table. Years ago, I my first call, I was an associate pastor in a church in, in Puerto Rico, in Guaynabo, Puerto Rico, or, or say with an American accent, uh, right outside of San Juan, Puerto Rico. And uh, there was a woman that I knew from, from a group that I would go to, AAUW, American Association of University Women. And so I, she was not a regular attender, but when she filed forward for communion, I said to her, Becky, the body of Christ broken for you. She told me later that because I used her name, it was like God was like Becky the body of Christ broken for you. I'm not taking credit for that. That's totally a God, a totally a God thing. God is so good. But her eyes were opened that this relationship to God was offered to her and it rekindled in her a desire to be back amongst the faithful and on a journey of faith. In seminary class years ago, we were talking about the different and again, different faith traditions around the table, and people were talking about their experiences of the Lord's Supper, and and some people had some you know, very uh, profound stories, spiritual experiences, and this one woman, she's a, a German Lutheran from from Germany, and she says, "I have no idea what you people are talking about, but I know that when I go to this to the table." And when the bread is put in my hand, I can touch and taste and smell and see that God is and that God is with me. You'll hear me say that a lot because she she touched my heart. When we come to this table, we get to touch and taste and smell and see that God is and that God is with us. I wish we were celebrating uh, communion this morning, but we're not. Uh, didn't uh, didn't you know connect those dots in time? But I'm going to let Mary Oliver have the last words. This poem is called "The Vast Ocean Begins Just Outside Our Church, the Eucharist." She wrote, "Something has happened to the bread and the wine." They have been blessed. What now? The body leans forward to receive the gift from the priest's hand, then the chalice. They are something else now from what they were before this began. I want to see Jesus. Maybe in the clouds or on the shore. Just walking. Beautiful man and clearly someone else besides. 
On the hard days, I ask myself if I ever will. Also, there are times my body whispers to me that I have. Amen.